I'm honoured to be a part of the collaboration between the Society for Modern Greek Studies and the Hellenic Centre, Greek Poets in English. In this talk, I'm going to introduce the Greek poet Jenny Masteraki and read some of her poetry. I will be reading her poems in my own translations, unless otherwise stated. Jenny Masteraki was born in Athens in 1949 and studied Byzantine and medieval literature at Athens University. This is practically all we know about her, except that she has published four slim volumes of poetry, Rites of Passage, 1972, Kin, 1978, Tales of the Deep, 1983, and With a Garland of Light, 1989. Since 1989, she has not appeared in print, except as a translator. In addition to her recognised position as a leading poetic voice of the 20th century, Masteraki has had a distinguished career as a literary translator. She is the Greek translator of The Catcher in the Rye and The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. The defining historical event of Masteraki's poetic career was the brutal military coup of 1967. Masteraki was a student at Athens University and it is important to be aware that she came of age as a poet at a time of censorship. Indeed, her first published poems appeared in resistance anthologies. Under the censorship laws, books had to do exactly what they said on their covers. That is, the content had to conform exactly to the title. Writers therefore adopted the strategy of giving blandly literal titles to collections, such as 18 texts or six more texts. Group anthologies like these were a form of resistance in themselves, relying on strength in numbers. Masteraki contributed to one called Anti-Anthology, published in 1971, and to the collections Deposition 73 and Deposition 74, published in 1973 and 1974, as the titles suggest. Masteraki's first solo collection, Rites of Passage, was published towards the end of the dictatorship. Curiously, given her first-hand experience of censorship, Masteraki has made attempts to control translations of her work into English, insisting on correcting the finished texts, even though she is not a native speaker of English and even threatening to block publication of her third collection, Tales of the Deep, in Karen van Dyck's translation. I should therefore make clear that my translations, which are very free, have not been reworked or approved by Masteraki. So now I'm going to talk a little about the poetry itself and read some of it. In Masteraki's two earlier collections, both dating from the 1970s, the poetic voice is often playful, and there is a certain simplicity of form. These poems are generally easy to follow, in spite of some surrealistic elements, and often share more of the features of light verse than literary verse. But by the 1980s, Masteraki's poetry had become far more complex and metaphorical, with no real narrative content and very little reference to external reality. It had also become more lyrical and includes many allusions to other Greek poets. There is a light-heartedness in Masteraki's first collection, Rites of Passage, and to a lesser extent in her second collection, Kin, that is more or less absent from her later work. This makes the earlier collections a great deal easier to translate than the later ones. Masteraki's first collection, Rites of Passage, is full of playful contradictions and surreal scenarios. One of the section headings begins How I Squared the Circles of Dreams, and in the poem I'm going to read, the wooden horse of Troy refuses to speak to the press, claims to have a healthy diet, and once worked at a fairground. The translation is by N.C. Germanarchus. The Trojan Horse. The wooden horse then said, no, I refused to see the press, and they said why not, and he said he knew nothing about the killing, and anyway, he himself always ate lightly in the evenings. 
and once in his younger days he'd worked as a pony on a merry-go-round. This poem is typical of Masteraki's earlier verse. It is playful, undemanding and rather light on substance. In another poem from the same collection, Masteraki takes a humorous look at what it means to write poetry in the modern world. This poem is called The Poet. It must be difficult to be a poet. I wouldn't know. All I've been writing all my life are long despairing letters to the landlocked. I seal them up in bottles and I chuck them in the gutter. Masteraki's second collection, Kin, adopts a more personal voice, but still retains elements of playfulness. In the poem entitled Note, which I'm also going to read, the speaker's voice is pointedly and playfully Masteraki's own. Here, she considers the implications or connotations of her own name in relation to family aspirations and expectations, and her failed attempt to reclaim her identity by reverting from the fashionable westernised short form Jenny to the classical Iphigenia. One critic has compared Jenny Masteraki to Wendy Cope. Clearly with these two earlier collections, Rites of Passage and Kin, in mind. Note. My family always had a predilection for foreign sounding names. So when I was 10, I was given Jenny nationality. Probably in the secret hope that when I lost weight, I'd become a film star. Actually, I've since tried several times to revert to Iphigenia, having discovered the usefulness of an unusual name but by then it was too late. These days, if you go around calling yourself Iphigenia, girls with sensible names will just leave you for dust. Coming five years after Kin and 11 years after Rites of Passage, Tales of the Deep is completely different from these earlier collections. The poems in this collection are enigmatic and even obscure. Tales of the Deep may be seen in some ways as an exploration of the subconscious. Humour is not altogether lacking. One of the sections is called Three Songs for Use in Emergencies, but it is generally more sinister in tone than the earlier work. Love is characterised as the place where terrible things happen, and there is much talk of murder. This is also the collection in which Masteraki's indebtedness to Kavafi is most apparent, in lexical echoes rather than content or tone. The poems of this collection have a musicality that is lacking from the poems of the earlier collections, which, especially in the case of Kin, are often flat and prosaic. Here is the opening poem. A brief description of the place where terrible things happened. Let the wind blow, first of all, heavy and crimson from lengthy pitched battles, smoke from the mountains that glow, ancient ruins, mimed triumphs and murders. Shady the woods so that kings lose night chasers or ashen-faced rebels their weapons, but alone wheresoever the hunter behind him pursues. Another poem from the same collection, A Magic Charm to Ward You from a Serpent's Sting, has been translated by John Stathatos. A magic charm to ward you from a serpent's sting merciless enemies and all scabbed wounds. Five for the black vespers, three to call the priest. Ten is for a thread of bronze and the scarlet mare. Watch the way a wayward wind makes the waters royal. Six for skulls flung down a well and a crippled ferryman. Back and forth in dungeon deep go eleven pallid maids. Thirteen's for the shipmaster and the holy master builder. One is for the dragonborn, who will sink their ship beneath the waves. The unifying themes of Tales of the Deep are diffuse and difficult to pin down, but the later collection, with a garland of light, returns to and elaborates some of these themes, most notably water and love. Masteraki herself has referred to the affinity between her two later collections, describing them as siblings. With a garland of light, however, shows a much more assured lyricism 
and far greater coherence than tales of the deep. It is as though the raw experiences that Masaraki evokes in tales of the deep have been processed and assimilated, resulting in more polished and universally appealing poetry. To illustrate the thematic relationship between the two collections, I shall read a poem from each, in which violence and women's clothes are central elements. The first is from Tales of the Deep, in Karen van Dyke's translation, The Garments. The evidence stayed in the murderer's garden forever, shredded by a perfect blade, like clothes from a dowry sunk in marshes, thoughtlessly sewn by someone on the run. Velvet cloaks, silk and dimity, with the splendour of a bygone era. Warm changes of clothing, saturated with smells and noises. White vests and corselets, scattered with stabs and festoons, and those fragile garments they used to call camisoles. Deaths are dreamlike, but the agent is innocent, and his wound like a window that only gets trespassed at night. And here is the untitled one from With a Garland of Light. Her cherry red, her crimson silk, her best, the clothes she never wore for travelling, drowned in the lake. Safe harbour, empty bed, escape that lasts through battlefields, pale shrouds, the sound and rage, traumatic luminescent fall from grace. And as the kisses deepen towards dawn, the unforgotten knife cuts deeper still, as in a dark transgressive dream, sigh. Sleep of a woman who has known great fear, a jugular, a blood red fading song. With a Garland of Light was hailed by leading Greek critics as a masterpiece, and it is difficult to disagree with this assessment. Here, Masteraki is at her most serious. She is experimenting with the acoustic possibilities of language, working through illusion and suggestion. One has the sense that she is no longer joking, that she is now taking herself seriously as an artist. There are no underlying questions about poetic identity, as in the ironic distance between voice and poet in the poem from Kin that I read called The Poet. These are poems with a strikingly dense sound texture Masteraki uses understated but deeply musical iambics, assonance, alliteration and off-rhyme. In one poem, taking a real name as a starting point, she invents a string of nonsense names to talk indirectly about the dual loss of a woman's identity through love and sleep. As the female subject of the poem falls asleep in her lover's arms, he renames her more and more nonsensically. The poem has no title. For love he rocks her in his arms. For love alone he combs her hair, preparing her for sleep, and closes her, and sings to her, and softly calls the woman fading in his arms, changing her names in his delirium. Jemima rhyme, in other chimes, Cecile Lily, Delilah Lee, a paradisal sob, Alisa Lack, and now the bubble of her sleep rises above her. Now, like a magic lantern, sleep fragments her face. His fingers trace unswerving love across her lips, her silenced eyes, the woman uninhabited, Eliza Lie, Lilith, nailed by the comb in her hair to the lilies of sleep. The poems of With a Garland of Light are oblique and elliptical. They do not tell straightforward stories, but instead follow a dreamlike logic of their own, often associating images and scenes that do not share any obvious features. There are, however, themes running through the collection that connect the poems to each other, giving the poems a cumulative mosaic effect as they explore different aspects of the same nexus of themes. The main unifying themes of With a Garland of Light are Lovers and acts of love, sleep, death, travellers and journeys, and writing itself. Betrayal and loss are also explored. There is strong lexical echoing from one poem to another, although it, from one poem to another, sorry. Although it is not always easy to establish what is going on, 
and one of Mastaraki's key writing strategies is ambiguity. The reader is never in any doubt that this is, and is intended to be, poetry. I will now read a further selection from this collection. All the poems are untitled. Tender is sleep and everything it touches, leaving no wound, no scar, no mark of entry. Covering voices, tracks, nocturnal bleeding, scattering darkness. Demonic rainstorm of a summer night, a wild pursuit that breaks on river banks in sweet, harsh breathing, silence, splashing water. And tenderly it circles like a lover, casting its nets across the quiet waters, like heavy shadows on a moss green landscape. There will come a time of lamentation, enchantment, disbelief, regeneration, kisses that don't betray, and hope corroding our battered walls, our armour and our weapons. And all the names of all the constellations that watched our bitter wars will be forgotten. There will come a time of understanding, you will fall silent so that you can hear me. The voice of a stranger speaking in the darkness. Sigh of the battle weary, now disarming. And there will come a time of resolution. An angel sailing near the rocks in silence will count the risks of peace between old lovers. Because the kissing on the stairs, the parting, the ships, the laughing waves, the devil's dancing, because the dizziness, the wicked girl, white hair, tossed sails, the madness of embarking, scatter gold coins, let down your golden hair. Because the recognition scene again, for it will come and dawn will come again, biting the world in two, revealing love, miracles and rain. Because the fear of love, the lover's touch, the savage nakedness transfixed and lost, how like a grief, how very like a grief, the happy ending. These things were never predestined. Quicksilver, ink, premeditated murder, sleep. The journey of a man who says goodbye when he arrives, but sets out to return. Whose secret body is a sanctuary. Whose voice recalls one perfect word, articulating silence, the abyss, and mist across the surface of the seas. Lord of the stars arising from this prayer above the leafy gardens. For she was loved so much, you'll never find her where she has gone to brood, her mind astray, gilded and clasped by many hands, a thousand pins her dress to seal, a thousand stitches to conceal her wounds, her broken skin, the mouth that kissed. Injustice hewn from precious stones, the life force forged from silver gold until her fingers scarcely know the glittering, her tender molten fingers melting one by one into the gold vein dark. And now enclosed in iron robes, in silence, fear and passion spent, woman much loved, so beautiful, my God, and so depraved. Dream shrouded woman, sealed in sleep's glass case, and worn transparent by the restless years, in parched and sunless deserts of the mind, walled in by dried up veins, closed arteries, the body's cloisters. Immortal woman tossed up by the tide and washed ashore in glancing glassy shards of sea spray, in a place where none, not one, can touch her torpor. She sleeps in innocence and one man's love, Sleep suffocating tyranny defers the kisses of regret and bitterness, and silence falls. But in her darkest dreams, she dreams of him. Now may drowned memories, stagnating in dark pools, come back to perjure, curse and bless, come back. Their icy touch, their mouths, the bruises left by pleading in the night, the I need you's and I'll be theirs, Come back, bring back remorseless love. The pit is dug, the pools are dragged, the menacing black net that opened closes. Demonic longing for things past. 
he who possesses sacred art is saved, for he will travel on, perfect in death, tearing the night apart with freakish tales, like a refrain that chills the fires of hell, sunken ruins, bitter shipyards. With winds that winnow mountains, he will fly, enchanting charlatan in changing clothes, tamer of lions, wanderer of the world, the body bought and sold puts out new leaves. Unleashing words of frenzy, words that rend the slender darkness, rend the troubled seas, one thousand times and one, distract the mind and light up in the telling. Thus saved he travels on, perfect in death, unravelling a shining skein of light, brave gold digger who glories as though crowned before his time, and he shall glorify. Let there be light to light his path, let lightning perfectly disclose and freeze his somnolence with all its many faces, sleep-lorn passions, transients, whatever chance once chose. And like the thunderbolt that bound our vows, sounding the depths of wounds and measuring the terrible persistence with its force, he harnesses the darkness once again. Transcendent rider, grieving in the dark, light of my eyes, what evil follows you? What evil drowned you like a strident dawn that gathered you and then burst into flower? Dream lover on the roofs, crazed fisherman, dreamer and dreamed in terror's sweet embrace. He casts no shadow on the desert ice. Let there be light and then let there be light. In the warm shallows, backwash, marshy flats of sleep, how all things change. Away from ribbons, florins, precious stones, horses and riders merge, and who is now the thoroughbred? Fair wind, where is your sail? Sorrows of an intoxicating flight, the miracle of sand that mills the heart like finest glass. Hush now, as wounds are salved by silver lint, the angry rash is soothed, the journey's ghosts appeased, a secret colour, keel concealed in water, and a single singing bird. Our Lady Lady, what stone-hearted dawn. Thank you very much. <laughs>